Welcome to Trillions. I'm Joel Weber. And I'm Eric Balchudas. Eric, we got another guest. You brought him in. Martin Small. BlackRock. BlackRock. We hit the big time. We did. <laughs> We've made it, Joel. Yeah, this yeah. is actually about us. We hit the big time. <laughs> I like that. Way to pivot back. Uh, BlackRock's Black, huge. They're huge. And so BlackRock is the maker of iShares. iShares is the brand people know. iShares uh, has $1.4 trillion. That's almost 40%. Of all ETF assets. T. So that's trillion. Yeah, T. With a T. And Martin, he's in charge. Well, he's in charge of the U.S. iShares. Okay. And that's what all, all the numbers I just said so are he does US have a boss. iShares. Multiple bosses still, yeah. actually, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's in the middle, actually. So he's, Wait, he's, why are we interviewing again? Yeah, exactly. We'll just talk about him. <laughs> but, uh, but it's fascinating because he is sort of a wizard of the ETF industry as a whole and is sort of in charge of strategy, too. And he is just, he's where the future's going. Uh, he is sitting in a sweet spot. They have a lot of uh, highly liquid, high asset products that others would kill for at this point. This time on Trillions, we're going to look into the crystal ball of iShares. Martin, how did you find the ETF? My opening favorite question. So I actually found the ETF when I was in my old job at BlackRock. So I used to work in our advisory business where we worked with central banks and financial institutions. I don't know if you remember uh, a lot of the press that uh, BlackRock had during the financial crisis that was about BlackRock helps governments value hard-to-value assets. One of the things that I came upon uh, during that period of my career was many institutions were trying to figure out how to add liquidity to their portfolio and reduce transaction costs. And it's when we first started doing institutional consulting about ETFs. I had also done a lot of work at clearinghouses where they were starting to see more activity happen in ETFs. And they asked us questions like, how do we think about margining these? Are these equities? Are they bonds? How should we think about managing risk related to a, a bigger ETF marketplace? And all of that started in probably 2008 or 2009. That sounds uh, really boring. No, it was, in, it was incredibly electrifying. And in 2012, 13, we started working on term maturity ETFs. And I had worked with the iShares team uh, when I was working in BlackRock Solutions. And uh, about three years later, uh, Mark and uh, Larry asked, me to take over the U.S. and Canadian businesses. That would be Mark Weidman and Larry Fink. Not yes, insignificant players. Yeah. <laughs> Mark and Larry, yeah. Yeah, Mark yeah. and Larry. Yeah, we They're hang great. out with them all the time. Yeah, yeah. They're great. Uh, <laughs> so, so tell me about that because BlackRock actually, rewind the clock a little bit, acquired iShares. It basically, in hindsight, may have been the greatest acquisition of all time. Yeah, I mean, my metaphor is it, it is the Louisiana purchase of the asset management business. What you bought it for versus what the potential is uh, was amazing. What was behind the decision to do it? Because at the time, it definitely was you know a pretty penny to buy it. At, at the time, uh, everyone said universally that BlackRock was overpaying, that this was an impossible acquisition to try to manage, that bringing together uh, religious zealots from one camp with religious zealots from another with fundamental research-driven strategies and index-based strategies was impossible. Sounds like a TV show. People said it was impossible. Um, but the fact was, I think two things were really happening, the first of which really pertained to what our clients were talking about. So our clients were already talking about bringing together market cap weighted indexing at the core of their portfolios together with uh, things that we can't index, things that we can't turn into transparent, investable, rules-based bundles. And so Larry and the management team obviously heard all these things and said, this is what the portfolio of the future is going to look like. And they made a, a, a big bet on transformation of the industry. And here we are nine years later, and everybody says, God, you know, th that was obviously the Louisiana purchases. But at the time, uh, most people said it wouldn't work. Tell me about what you do, Martin. So I'm responsible for our iShares businesses in uh, the U.S. and Canada. Uh, as Eric said, in the U.S., we run about $1.4 trillion of ETFs at uh, roughly 370 products. And so I'm responsible for our business strategy. I'm responsible for our product teams, our sales teams in institutional and in wealth, uh, marketing, PR, communications. BlackRock has turned into a, a big matrix place. So part of that is through resources that are dedicated through iShares. And part of it is through resources that I've actually cover things horizontally at BlackRock across multiple product lines. Um, but our organization has always been, let's really manage uh, a product suite, which is the iShares business, uh, along client segments, institutional, uh, wealth, self-directed, whatever it might be. So I try to bring all those things together. Mm -hmm. Let me de-jargon that a little bit because I'm f this is fascinating. And you know, who are we talking to out there? We're mostly talking to retail advisors. Mm -hmm. You've got 1.3 trillion. Can you break that into a pie chart kind of of how much is institutional, like pensions, endowments, and such? 
How much is advisors, people who manage other people's money in the wealth side? And then how much is just do-it-yourself retail investors? So it, it broad strokes, it's 60, 30, 10. So it's 60% wealth managers. So think about your major wirehouse platforms, your financial advisors. Uh, about 30% global institutions. So that's securities and derivatives buyers. It might be a professional asset manager. It might be an ETF strategist. It might be a pension plan, an endowment, a foundation, whatever. And then about 10% self-directed uh, who would come through customer-facing retail brokerages like Fidelity. And isn't this interesting time where all, all of those people are in the same fund. In mutual funds, they separate those investors. If you got a lot of money, you're going to be in the I-class for less fees. ETFs, it's like Sam's Wholesale Club. Everybody gets the same price. People come at it for different reasons. Is that unique that all these investors are playing in the same sandbox? We think of our business in segments. We have client segments and we have product use segments. So we have client segments. That's what we're talking about, right? We're talking about institutional investors, wealth managers like FAs, and we're talking about self-directed investors. How they use the products is actually different. So you can have an institutional investor that would use the same product as a financial advisor or self-directed investor, like IVV, our S&P 500 index fund, at four basis points. People use it as a trading vehicle. People use it as a long-term buy and hold. Um, it applies to uh, uh, lots of different segments that come together. And honestly, it's the coming together that makes the products have more viability, right? So when institutions and wealth managers and retail investors come together, they actually make for network effects that the products become they have more utility for people. This is fascinating. That is fascinating. That was the best answer I've heard on that topic. Network effect. Network. That got a lot of people going, and that's, that's true. It, it's, uh, it, if, it is unbelievable. I look at uh, a product like uh, EEM, or IMG is a good example. That's their emerging markets that's um, on the cheaper side. Brit, it's 14 basis points. You know, a lot of retail Modest investors plus. own that. A lot of advisors own it. And then Bridgewater, that's the world's largest hedge fund, owns it. It is just unusual to see all those people using the same product. It's just Are they uh, still the largest holder of it. I think so. Yeah, Bridgewater owns EEM and IMG. I think they're slowly they own both. One's more liquid, one's cheaper. I think if you add it together, they're probably the largest owner of the iShares Emerging Markets Suite. Am I wrong? They own a lot. It's like four billion, right? Per the thirteen F filings, yes. So think about it. Uh, the world's largest hedge fund, access to everything. And they call this guy. <laughs> and they call. But guys, think about why, right? Like, if I ask you in the MSCI Emerging Markets Index, how many countries are there and how many currencies? There's 23 countries and 10 currencies. So if you're Bridgewater, you say, "Do I really want to go be active in 23 countries? Get 23 securities licenses? Set up 23 sub custodial accounts? Like, pay transaction costs for every one of those securities? Like, there's a reason that easy when you button. but when you bundle this stuff in the easy button, that it becomes just it, it becomes easier to transact. Like Greenwich Associates. It's just released its 2018 study on institutional investors. And the number one thing they cite about ETF usage is that it's simple and easy to access. And so as they reduce their footprint in dealing with all this stuff that is just plumbing that they don't want to deal with, they can buy the whole index. They can buy the whole world basically in you know the same thing that you'd buy in your Fidelity account. Okay, I'm going to give away my big idea. You ready? <laughs> we've, we've been sitting on it for a while. Hit me. Why isn't there an ETF with the easy ticker, easy button? Well, what would it hold? Well, like everything? Yeah, like perfectly diversified portfolio. Maybe we should change the uh, Acqui ticker to easy. You can, you can, you can just no, pay it, me now. I think <laughs> you have AOK, right? That's the asset allocation that holds other ETFs that eventually hold everything. AOK is pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good, right? That's a good rival. It's interesting. ETFs that hold other ETFs that try to do all that for you, they, they're not really big hits. I think people like really to assort – Assort the puzzle pieces in their own way, doing asset allocation. But um, I was asked at, a, at an event yesterday about uh, whether an ETF VTFs could be a hit. I mean, they're already they exist. They exist. But asset allocation ETFs haven't really taken off. We we have a whole we, we have a whole range of them. So we have, for example, IYLD would be the closest thing to easy. IYLD is a multi asset. I got to tell you, portfolio. one is a better ticket than the other. I know. I'm going with easy. <laughs> Although yeah. IYLD, like I yield, it's pretty good, right? <laughs> IYLD is a multi asset income portfolio. We have the core allocation series funds that would say you're conservative, moderate, aggressive, and it puts together a 60, 40, 70, 30, 80, 20 portfolio. Here, here's the rub, though, and and I I think Eric, you're right on this, which is if you're a financial advisor and you want to show your client that you're building a multi-asset diversified portfolio, if you show up for the client meeting and you say, here, I'm here with AOK, all done, they go, 
uh, I'm paying you 1% of my assets. <laughs> yeah. This doesn't feel like you're doing what you want to do. Yep. In addition, I'd say clients all have – I know I'm being a little facetious, but clients all have something they're looking for that's different than a stock port, a, a standard portfolio. Mm-hmm. So usually you're going to want some more customization in terms of target risk, return, levels of income. And so uh, one size fits all asset allocation ETFs. Um, there's a market. It's just not a very big market. I want to ask a, another question because we talked about Larry – who's technically the boss of the boss, and we talked about Mark. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to me about, and you came up on the BlackRock side, right, and then jumped to the iShares. So can you talk to me about the evolution? I do. I work at BlackRock. I sell iShares. There you go. All right. So talk to me about that acquisition that we talked about, the Louisiana Purchase. How has the company's culture evolved, because you've evolved the marketplace, but like internally, what sort of changed about BlackRock and iShares in the process? Uh, Larry is – for as long as I've been at BlackRock, when I, when I came to BlackRock, it was a U.S.-centric bond manager sort of the end of 2005, 2006. It had something like $300 billion of assets and 1,100 people. I thought it was huge. I, I thought it was enormous. Uh, and we did several transformative acquisitions along the way. In 2006, we merged with Merrill Lynch Investment Managers. And that, I would say, was our, our first step in really transforming um, – Not so much the culture of the firm, but the identity and capabilities of the firm. Mm -hmm. So we went from being a U.S.-centric bond manager to truly being a global investment firm that was in 26 countries, 62 cities. But the biggest change was all of a sudden a third of our assets were in equities. Mm -hmm. Uh, And for a bond house and for people who grew up in bonds, beginning to think of the world of equities is just totally different. Talk to me about that. How do bond people view the world and how is that different than this new 30 percent that just showed up? Is it like going from chess to checkers? (laughs) <laughs> because bonds have a maturity. They, they're much more complicated, at least for someone like me approaching from the outside. They are harder to get your head around than stocks. I think that's absolute rubbish and fiction. Bonds are pretty, <laughs> bonds are pretty simple. Like, bond, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's some amount of interest over some period of time and some ending date. Like, that's it. Bonds are pretty simple. And what drives prices in bonds is interest rates, credit spreads, curve, and ultimately some degree of liquidity. Equities are like poker. Bonds are like chess, right? Like equities, you know, you could say something about there's a 75 percent probability that this will be the result in equities. You might have made a good decision, like Annie Duke would say, but 25 percent of the time you were wrong. In bonds, it's, it's really more chess, right? The, things are, the outcomes are pretty binary. So how did that change you? Um, I, I really think what it did was it, it changed the conversations that we were having with all of our clients. So it used to be we were hardcore bond people. We talked about mortgage prepayment speeds. We talked about relative value and credit spreads. But now we really started to talk about holistic portfolio outcomes. What are you really trying to do with your whole balance sheet? What are you really trying to do to generate a 7% return for your pension uh, plan participants? That's a really different set of conversations. And it requires, I'd argue, like a different kind of person at the firm. So what you would have seen over periods of time is, more people who are holistic portfolio construction and asset allocation people rather than people who are focused on, uh, do I pick Verizon versus AT&T at the five-year key rate duration? Um, What Larry has been relentless about over the entirety of my time there and since inception of the firm has been culture. Mm -hmm. Uh, Larry is ruthless about culture. His view is we are a client-focused, client-centric business. Uh, BlackRock, I'm quite certain, has had uh, literally hundreds of opportunities to go into balance sheet proprietary businesses, and we've never done that. We've mm-hmm. stayed in the fiduciary business, working solely for our clients. And that is the North Star. Um, you know, it, I, I find we're hard-pressed like to go wrong. Yeah, right. And let's talk about fixed income a little bit because you guys have one of the most controversial ETFs, HYG. We've discussed it many times. It packages junk bonds. Coming from the junk bond space – just this uh, couple days ago at the Milken conference, this came up again as a worry. Now, leaving aside the motivations of the people who are worried, I know some of them are active managers and it might be uh, not the right messenger, but it's a persistent fear that how can you take something that's not that liquid, say junk bonds or any bonds really, they don't trade like stocks, and put it in this stock-like trading vehicle. Will there be a problem or some kind of an issue if everyone heads for the exit at once? Yeah, so I, I, I think the, the first thing I'd say is uh, the uh, the claims of the illiquidity of the high yield market are greatly exaggerated. This is a market in the U.S. that has one point four trillion dollars of outstanding balances. Uh, year to date, I think we've had uh, over the counter trading and high yield of a trillion dollars. That's about twelve to fourteen billion dollars a day of average daily volume in high yield bonds, cash trading. 
Uh, if I take all the high yield ETFs, I take every last single one of them, uh, and I look at uh, HYG, I look at the other competitor products, there's $50 billion of high yield ETF assets. Year to date, the entirety of redemptions for the most funds is about $6 billion. That's like the entirety of uh, the, bo- the bonds that have come out of the high yield ETF space. And it's, so I compare numerator $6 billion over a trillion dollars of, of trading year to date in cash bonds. That's not even 1%. So just the math to me doesn't work as to how uh, high yield ETFs are causing any degree of price distortion in high yield. Now, here's the thing that is true. The high yield market is more cumbersome to transact in. So if you want to move two to four hundred million dollars of high yield, you have to not call one broker dealer anymore. You might have to call three, four, five to go find the bonds you want. This should not be a mystery then that it's easier and cheaper and lower transaction costs to trade. HYG, which packages up the whole bundle. So if you tried to buy all the bonds that are in the basket of HYG in the portfolio, it would cost you 50 basis points in transaction costs, but HYG is a penny. That makes sense because I don't have to go do all this nuisance value of uh, doing all those things up. 85 to 90 percent of the orders in HYG, uh, it's like, Eric, you sell me your shares and I buy them from you on exchange and nothing happens in the fund. That's why I think in hindsight, the Louisiana purchase, if you will, was so genius because bond guys looked out and said, wait a second, there's a better way. And it it looks more like an equity, right? Like we can go get ETFs. It stems from the fantasy, though, of the complexity of the bond market. It's it's a fantasy. Like Mm -hmm. it really is. And I think it's more people talking their book than it is truth. Like we've known forever in the equity world, when we take 23 countries and 10 currencies in EM and we put it into one composite security like an ETF, it trades with lower transaction costs. Shouldn't the same be true for bonds? Mm -hmm. I think so. One question I have, right? You guys have something that I call the four-headed monster. And I really – we talk about the portfolio of the future. You have IVV, which is S&P 500, IEMG, which is emerging markets, IEFA, which is developed international, AGG, which is like your total bond. That's really a pretty good portfolio for most people. What do you call it? I just call it the core of the core. There you go. Yeah. I, I try to decorate my uh, research <laughs> with some stuff because i got to get readership. But anyway. There's a reason people story. read your stuff and not yeah. mine, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> so this four-headed monster uh, just takes in cash like crazy. I think the all-in fee for this portfolio would be about seven or eight basis points, somewhere in there. Other issuers have these core that are very similar. We call it the core wars. If this is the portfolio of the future – some people on Twitter come back to me and say, if everyone's in these same portfolios that are just like this, that could be a problem in terms of crowding for investors. So what do you say about this uh, concept of everyone using this as the portfolio of the future? So uh, for one, I think there's there's lots of great ideas about the portfolio of the future. So an even simpler portfolio would be like ITOT, the total stock market index at three basis points, IXUS, which is EFA plus EM, and then AG, IAG. Those four tickers at a blended rate of five, four, five basis points would get you basically the efficient market hypothesis in, in one shot. And I'd argue that that's kind of the way institutions have been investing since the early 1970s. And so that market doesn't actually look very different than the institutional market looks today. It's just implemented in ETFs. Um, In terms of it being much, much bigger, there is so much room to grow. Like if I really take all of the global equities, like the entirety of stock and bond market cap in the world, like let's just talk about the US. In the US, there's $24 trillion of market cap in the Russell 3000, right? If I take all the equity ETFs, like we're, you know, one twelfth of that, right? We're this teeny tiny sliver. So there's just ample room to grow. The second is, All that stuff is already in those exposures, right? It's just in different wrappers. So the migration of assets from one wrapper to another wrapper in the mutual fund industry doesn't actually change any of the net supply demand dynamics for stocks. So I think it's wholly irrelevant where assets are located. What matters is what's the velocity of trading and is turnover relatively high? Um, 95% of daily volumes in U.S. equities is not done by ETFs or index funds. Right, it's people doing stock picking. It's my mom in her pajamas and her fidelity account. All right, it's best time to trade <laughs> pajamas. <laughs> All right, really loosens the spirit up. <laughs> people are more uninhibited then, you know. Yeah. Um, I audience. want to talk a little bit about this idea of that do-it-yourself retail investor. How many of those people are the new day traders? You remember the '90s? The day traders were the retail investors doing Oracle and Microsoft. Some data is showing that now they're using ETFs to do that day trading. Do you find that uh, to be something? And 
I guess part of that, that that feeds into Jack Bogle's criticism of ETFs, which is they tempt people to trade too much and thus you lose money. Yeah. So the, the there is no doubt that uh, day traders, uh, active asset allocators, and even like active mutual fund managers are using beta building blocks to uh, run asset allocation portfolios or to make tactical calls on markets. Uh, and if you were to look at Fidelity, E-Trade, Interactive Brokers, TD Ameritrade, Schwab, uh, all of them have places where people are, are using ETFs alongside single stocks in order to take views on markets. Uh, in fact, if you looked at something like TDA's Thinkorswim platform, you're seeing listed options uh, volumes on ETFs go up as well, um, all of which is to say um, these are more instruments for people to take market views on, and, and that just makes for a more efficient market. It makes for more price discovery tools. As far as the frequency of trading, with all due respect to um, you know one of the godfathers of our industry, it's just not right, and the data doesn't bear it out. And I know people love to quote it, but it's just uh, absolute fiction. Okay. So what does the future look like for iShares? Because you talked about, what was it, an eighth of the equity, overall equity market. How, are, how will iShares grow? Uh, I think we're going to grow uh, predominantly for, for three reasons. And I'd argue that th- these are all structural forces. They're like inexorable. They're indelible impressions. Like they are cha- like people are changing the way they're doing business. Um, so if you're a financial advisor, you are moving your practice to fee-based advisory and to asset allocation portfolios. The ETF is the ultimate building block at low cost for that. If you're an institutional investor, you are finding ways to simplify your operations and you want to be able to trade in a fric- frictionless, transparent, on-exchange electronic market. The ETF is ultimately a great engine for those things. And then finally, um, and Eric talks about this sometimes, we're going through what, what I'd argue to you is like the, the beginning of the golden age of indexing. So when I talk to people about indexing, people immediately think market cap weighted indexing. And market cap weighted indexing is great, right? It, it actually does tell us something about the depth, breadth, investable opportunity set in a market. But like God did not hand down market cap weighted indexing on the tablets of Sinai as the only way of doing an index. And so we're going to see this pulling apart, this unbundling of things that can't be indexed. I'd call that alpha, from things that can, things that can be subjected to a set of rules. And that's where I think factor ETFs and smart beta comes comes in, which is I know how to index the value premium. It's mm-hmm. just a set of rules about price to earnings, price to book, and enterprise value to EBITDA. I know how to do a quality screen. And so as we give people more of those building blocks, I think what you'll see is a portfolio of the future that has 50 to 60 percent market cap weighted indexing. It has 50 to 20 percent uh, sort of persistent risk premia like factors. And then we'll have a bunch of stuff that can't be indexed, market time stock selection, illiquids. Uh, That, to me, looks like what the most sophisticated institutional portfolios are doing today. Speaking of institutions and and their portfolios, one of the frontiers that has not been sort of captured by ETFs, they haven't figured out how to do it, is real assets or private equity or venture capital. He says, less companies stop going public. A lot of people are saying this is where investors are going to have to go. Or stay private longer. Or stay private longer. Um, is there any way for ETFs to capture it, either by you or if you could speak out of the iShares brand, is it possible for anyone to do it, even an ETN? Could this be done? There is so much white space in indexing. Uh, it's absolutely incredible. There's just huge swaths of the marketplace that we haven't touched yet. Real assets is definitely one. Uh, there are some products in Europe that have tried to sort of mimic through public equities and inflation portfolios the behavior of uh, real estate over long periods of time. I think we're at early days on that. But we are deep in the innovation and research lab at iShares right now, working on public markets proxies for traditionally private exposures. So if I told you I could give you 85% of the return of venture capital at one one thousandth of the price, would you be interested? Like, I think the answer is categorical. I want to yes. go to this lab. <laughs> it's like Bell <laughs> Labs, we? but cooler. Yeah. Do Can you visit? Is, is there a lab coat? We... <laughs> Absolutely. There's a we'll big whiteboard, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which trends don't get talked about enough? I, I think it's two things. Uh, the first of which is the replacement of derivatives by ETFs. I never see people write about this stuff, but futures cost 10 to 15 times more than ETFs, like in the S&P 500, uh, and we're starting to see that migrate. The second thing is taxes. People just don't think enough about net after-tax returns, and we write a lot about expense ratios. We write a lot about transaction costs, but I think people really don't think about the implication of taxes, Mm -hmm. and it is really one of the, uh, I think, most attractive and compelling features for a taxable investor of exchange-traded funds. In iShares, 95% of our funds plus have and distributed a capital gain like ever. And uh, one question I get asked a lot is, when's the first free ETF going to come out? Now, my answer usually is look at tracking. There are some that use SEC lending to actually give you back a little basis points, and therefore it is free already. But moving that little technicality aside, it will we see a zero 
0.0% expense ratio in the next couple of years. I have no doubt that people will launch them because they have other revenue models. So if, if for example, you have a customer-facing retail brokerage platform, Schwab. You, you might launch zero-fee ETFs in order to bring people in your system and monetize them another way. Like you might take the cash that sits in your brokerage account and invest it at a spread in your bank. I have no doubt we'll see zero-fee ETFs. You're not going to see them from iShares. I, I, one, I think we will continue to reduce the cost of investing, but everybody has fixed costs at the end of the day. Our fixed costs are much lower than many other people's because of our scale and the breadth of our platform, our use of technology. So we added $207 billion of new assets in U.S. iShares last year. I didn't grow the expense line by uh, you know that, that level either. So we have lots of scale to continue to grow our business, pass along savings to, uh, to our clients and shareholders. But at the end of the day, I got no plans to offer a, a zero-fee ETF. And what I'd say is you know, 80% of the industry is starting to consolidate in like two to three players, um, which has been true for the last three, four, five years. But at the end of the day, our business is going to look more like cloud computing or cell phones in industry structure, which is if I ask you guys, like, what phones do you have? Everyone's going to tell me Verizon, AT&T. There'll be a couple of people who have Sprint and T-Mobile. But, like, that's going to serve the market. Uh, unlike other industries where you have uh, relative industry consolidation, the two biggest players are driving pricing down, not up, which is, I, I think, a good thing. But we both have fixed costs at the end of the day. Uh, and we so don't, there's a floor. There's a floor. Like, there's an equal. I would call it an equilibrium at which we need to maintain uh, discipline about quality of service. As Eric said, like our paramount objective is tracking our portfolios and tracking our indexes, deploying material amounts of capital against the index and realizing the published return. If we don't do that, we're out of business. What's your last question? I want to talk about your music career. <laughs> my, my failed music career is what you mean. One of my friends at iShares, Kate Bernhard, uh, sent me a picture of you on stage. I look forward to working for Kate Bernhard one day. I'll tell you that. <laughs> you got to meet Kate. She's great. Um, so she's a singer. That's her sort of slash career. She's performed a lot. She's really great. She sent me a picture of you on stage. What instrument do you play? What kind of music do you like? We love talking music metaphors here. And do you play regularly? So uh, I have been uh, I, I've been a guitar player since I was nine, ten years old, and my plan was to stay in school and go to. You know, I went to law school mostly to kill time, so I could try to build my music career. Uh, and it's an expensive I played, way to kill some time. I, I, don't tell my parents. <laughs> uh, and so I, I, I did a lot of work in trying to build bands and a recording career and. Uh, we did okay. I had a band. I, I played in two bands at the time, sort of uh, through college, through law school, right afterwards for a number of years. And then I just discovered that uh, I just wasn't good enough at it. But I love playing. I love playing guitar. I play guitar almost every day. I'm an avid guitar collector. I won't tell you how many I have, but it's a lot. Uh, how, many, and how many do you have? It's a lot. Uh, <laughs> I tried. <laughs> it's a lot. And uh, I'm Electric just, I'm or obsessed. acoustic or I, both? Electric. And I have a particular bent. So I, I collect a lot of the things that I lusted after when I was like 13. So I collect a lot of arena rock guitars from like Winger and Slaughter. Nice. And oh my God. Glam rock. Glam, Hair metal. I like to call it arena rock. Hair metal. Because that's a little cooler. But Rat. for example, I own four guitars, <laughs> four guitars from, uh, can you name the guitarist of Winger? Uh, Kip Winger? No, he was the singer. Oh, and, and that's the only... It was named after him. Red Beach. Red Beach. He went on later to play in Dokken. Wow. I don't know if you know Dokken. Four? Yes. Uh, Dokken. He had played with Chaka Khan earlier in his career, but I own four of his guitars because I think they're super four cool. four of his... Yeah, let's do the math. You probably own 20. I'm, I'm, I was going to go I own more, more than, than 20. Is it more than 50? It might be. Wow. Mm. We can have a concert. There's a house. high probability that it's more than 50. Okay, my last question, if that was his... What is your master plan? What is my master plan? Uh, you know, for me, I, I know this will seem boring, but uh, I've never really planned out my career. I never have. I started my career as a lawyer. I wound up uh, being rather interested and obsessed about the intersection of capital markets, balance sheets, and regulation. And everything I've done in my career has been about that. And so long as I get to keep progressing, keep learning, like in that area, mm -hmm. I, I get super motivated to go to work every day. And the other thing is, um, I just, I, I really do enjoy being around people. Uh, like I like getting to know new people and the ETF business is just such a great place to go out and meet financial. I was in Atlanta yesterday. 
yesterday. I met with advisors at Morgan Stanley, at UBS, at Ballantyne, the RIA. I went to a whole bunch of places just to talk to people and learn about their clients, their business, their problems, their challenges. Um, to me, it's like one big puzzle, uh, and nothing makes me happier in this business. Like flows are great, you know, but changing somebody's mind, like that, that's my mission. If I can just change your mind about one thing, mm-hmm. I get super motivated about that. So at the end of the day, I'd really like to convince everybody that like everybody should be an index investor. Like if you're not indexing some part of your portfolio, like you just haven't arrived yet. Martin Small, thanks for joining us on Trillions. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Thanks for listening to Trillions. Until next time, you can find us in the Bloomberg Terminal, Bloomberg.com, Apple Podcasts, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. We'd love to hear from you. We're on Twitter. I'm at Joel Weber Show. He's at Eric Balchunas. Trillions is produced by Magnus Hendrickson. Francesca Levy is the head of Bloomberg Podcasts. Bye.